Well, good afternoon, True Hope family. It is great to be together. And uh, if you weren't here in person, revolutionary and uh, good grace, I believe. Come Holy Spirit, what great ways to, to, to worship. Today's uh, message title is, Listen Up, Final mm -hmm. Words Matter. Mm -hmm. Just so you know, you know, just so you know, they do matter. And I think that we may have been in places where you've had to say goodbye to someone. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've seen a movie where people like, uh, moved from England to the United States back in the 1800s or early 1900s, they got on a ship and these families may never see each other again, right? And so what do you say in those final words? Your final chance. Some of us have experienced the loss of someone recently and what, do you, what, what is that? Those final words typically we try to say the thing that you want to make sure that person remembers, that they know, that they will take with them. You want to make sure you've said you really still needed to say. Um, I try to make it a habit of, of ending things or at least somewhere along the line say, I love you. Because you know, you know of the stories where, where people were in a massive fight and, and the tragedy struck and that was the last thing. We don't want that to be. And so we are at the end of Galatians. We made it, <laughs> Another book under our belt. We've done good, right? We've done all of Genesis. We've done 1 John. We've now finished Galatians. We've done some other things in between, but oh my goodness. And so we are now at the final words. So I'm sure the Apostle Paul wanted to make sure that they knew, like if you didn't listen to anything else I said so far, pay attention. Listen up. But before we get to what he's actually saying, I just want to remind us that Galatians was that book that he wrote to the people in the area of the Galatia, the churches there, and they had started out well. They were wild pagan people. They found Jesus. They followed the Spirit, and then they got trapped by legalism. And you know, Jesus is not religion. Sure. Anybody remember what religion means from last time? Yeah. No. Bound up. Yeah, and in fact, rebound up, right? So here you are, you've been set free. Woo! Woo! Hands, feet, mouth, everything moves. And then somebody comes along and goes, uh-oh, what if your hands lead you into sin? What if your eyes lead you into sin? What if your mouth leads you into sin? Pretty soon, what good are you going to be? You can't right. move. So Jesus came to set us free, Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom Christ came to set us free. So don't be rebound. Don't be bound up again. Don't give in to religion. So people say, well, I'm not religious. I mean, we celebrate. Yes, good job. We don't want you to be religious. There's no hope in religion. There's hope in the person of Jesus. So that's what Paul's been trying to say. And the lie that they believed it had to, that it was sin or religion. <laughs> nope. Neither. It is Jesus. And then... Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, right, will keep you from a life of sin, but also will set you free from religion. Neither one is the answer. So we saw some contrast in Galatians. We saw the contrast between being in bondage all over again and liberty, freedom. Like, who doesn't want to be free? And it's not free to do whatever you want. It is free to be all that God wants you to be, which there is no greater freedom. It was uh, the contrast between flesh and it being attracted to all things world and the spirit. It was the contrast between living for self and living for others. You know, when you live for yourself, you're the most lonely person to play. <laughs> People aren't right. all that interested in ha helping you have your party. <laughs> That's right. But if you pour your life in others, there's community. There was, a, and now there's the contrast between spirit-led lives lived for God's glory or legalist living for their own uh, for themselves and for the praise of people you know praise of people is fickle they may think you're all that today and five minutes from now maybe not so much right so if you live for that boy you're in trouble 
So Galatians 6, 11 through 18, this closes the book for us. And Paul starts out in verse 11 saying, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. We don't know for sure why, uh, what exactly he means. If he wrote the whole book by himself, or just these last parts, there's, there's differing opinions on that. But Paul typically dictated his letters. So he might have had an eye affliction, he may not have been able to see well. He may have written in a different style of Greek that used capital letters, larger capital letters, than the more current Greek. So who knows what it means. But he's saying, I wrote this. See with what large letters I wrote this, this uh, letter with my own hand. But what he's really saying is, listen up, pay attention. This is my message to you and need you to hear. And then he contrasts three people groups, the legalists, Jesus and himself. And he is saying, as many of the legalists, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. They are persuaders. They compel you. They force you to do what they say you must do. They are uh, compromisers. They're not doing it because they themselves are doing it. They're doing it to to not have to be in pain themselves. They are hypocrites because they're not keeping the law. And they're boasters because they're, they want the attendance. One more person attending their little band. Look, we've got this man now. And this is, this is still, unfortunately, happening a lot in our day. But basically, all they cared about is that you look good on the outside. Mm -hmm. That it is that something they could point to because I mean 613 right uh, Richie laws but they had to keep yeah so why pick circumcision as the only litmus test for whether you are keeping the law <laughs> besides it doesn't apply to half of us so, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad they picked that one you <laughs> just kidding but I'm, I'm just saying why that one right but it's something you can. You can see, I mean, probably not being shown, but regardless, it's an outward symbol of compliance. And they compel you to be, they force it, because they want to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. You know, we wear these things, I have one on, you know, a bunch of you. It wasn't jewelry back in the day. The cross was a detested symbol. It was the worst form of death, where the worst of the worst got killed. It was something that was super humiliating, super shameful. It was the last thing you wanted to do. They, you know, it's like if your family member did that bad thing. In our, in our little community, we may have that family member or know of somebody else's family member that did that thing that normal people don't talk about. We talk about it, because for us, but you know, but you don't want to talk about your crazy uncle that, or you don't want to talk about that guy that got crucified. That's not something to be proud of in your family, right? But th that's what it was like. And so the cross of Christ was not something these legalists wanted. That was, you know, anti-everything they believed in that the Messiah would come. And so they didn't want these people to obey the law because it was good for them, but it, they wanted the people to obey the law so that they themselves didn't have to suffer for Christ the cross. And then Paul continues, they want you to keep the law, but they're not even doing it themselves. I mean, that is terrible, right? And how many people do we know? That's like, it's for the show of it. But they want to boast in your flesh, in the outside, not the new creation that Paul has been talking about. It reminded me of how Jesus addressed the Pharisees and the scribes in Matthew 23. Mm -hmm. 23, 27, and 28, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! Hypocrites! I mean, that's what these people were, right? For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautifully outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. I mean, the tombs were not in the ground like we do, but they were on top and they were whitewashed clean. They looked, they could look good, but a tomb has what? Dead people inside and <laughs> bones. I mean, it's not pretty. And he's saying, you guys are like pretty looking tombs, but you're dead on the inside. And all uncleanness, even so you 
also outwardly appear righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's what was going on with these legalists that had visited Galatia, that were forcing them. They wanted outward compliance, but they themselves were like these Pharisees, dead. There's no life in religion. There's yeah. life in Jesus. And Jesus also said in Matthew 23, earlier in the chapter 4, they find heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves would not even lift them with one of their fingers. Remember how Paul said earlier, carry one another's burdens, those burdens that are too heavy to bear, because these people would do that. They would weigh all that stuff, keep all 613 lost. We can't do it, but you, to be real Christians, need to do this. You know, and pile, and pile, and pile, and just like the Pharisees wouldn't lift a finger to help. And Paul says, you carry your own burdens, but simultaneously bear one another's burdens. You need to do that. And so that's what he's, he's addressing, I believe, here. For they're not keeping the law, and they're not helping you, because they just want to boast in, in you. But it's about a new creation. And Paul switches then and says, but God forbid that I should boast. But he is basically saying, but as for me, God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So he is boasting in the very thing we just talked about, saying that is an awful thing. Nobody wanted to talk about that cross. Nobody wanted to think about a cross. That wood structure was not something to glory or to be proud of. It was something horrific and, and awful. But he says, if I'm going to boast in one thing, it's the cross. And not the wooden structure, but the atoning death of Jesus on the cross. Because that's the only thing that gets us from death to life. And he says, our Lord Jesus Christ, he's saying, reminding them, Dudes, you're in this with me. You belong to Jesus also. Don't be confused by these legalists. Don't go there. Remember. Um, Paul glorifies, uh, glories in the cross because he knew that Jesus was the person of the cross. In Galatians, 45 times he either mentions or refers to Jesus. One third of the verses are about Jesus. So just in case you didn't get what this is about, it's about Jesus, it's about Jesus, it's about Jesus, it's about Jesus. What's Galatians about? It's about Jesus. It's only Jesus. And he uh, glories in the power of the cross, because it, uh, this was in one of the commentaries, in, death, in the death and resurrection of Christ, the power of God is released to give believers deliverance and victories. It's Jesus' death that released the power for us to have victory and deliverance. So he glories in the cross because it's only through that that Paul himself was freed from this religious legalism that had him trapped into the freedom that he has in Christ. And finally, he glories in the cross because of the purpose of the cross was to create a new people, a new person, but also a new people, a new Israel of God. See, there was the original Israel that God chose, God's chosen people. But post-Jesus, anyone who believes in Christ is the new Israel of God. So all the promises that God made to Israel is made to us. We are the Israel of God if we believe in Jesus. And so Paul is saying he is dead to the world, and the world is dead to him. And one of the commentaries said this, and I thought it was so funny, you don't need rules for a dead man. <laughs> <laughs> can't keep him, right? You need a new man. And so we, Paul is focusing on the fact, don't try to fix by behavior the old dead man. Be the new man. Because the love of Christ compels us. We're new and free. And so we don't need shackles. We don't need chains. We don't need a blindfold or a gag. The love of Christ compels us to do right. The more you love Jesus the less attracted you are to doing the opposite of what he wants. It just becomes less and less. What was fun, you're like, I used to like this. Why? Because there's nothing fun in, be, in, in being out of step with Jesus. It just loses its flavor. So, for in Christ Jesus, verse 15, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. 
There's nothing. It doesn't matter. The laws, it's not about the laws. It's about the new creation. And the world is nothing. Jesus is everything. And then he says, and as many, remember he said, as many as desire to make a good showing, the legalist. Now he's saying, and as many as walk according to this rule, this straight rule. All of you who believe in Jesus, that are following him, as many as walk according to this straight rule of light, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. That's us. He's saying, peace and mercy be on you. You follow Jesus, you are living according to the Spirit. Peace and mercy be on you. And on the Israel of God, all of God's people. It's kind of cool to be the Israel of God, I think. And then he concludes, from now on, let no one trouble me. It's kind of a stern warning, I feel. And he, because they've been, you know, the legalist called, said, said he was a hypocrite, that he was a liar, that he wasn't a real apostle. They called him all sorts of things. And he said, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The word he uses there is the word that was used for the marks that it put on slaves. They used to brand slaves. Slavery was common in, well, slavery has been common as long as people have been people uh, outside of the Garden of Eden, but it was common and an accepted practice in those days. And we're not talking about the justice of it or the unjust of it, justice of it, but slaves were branded with the owner's mark. So you knew who they belonged to. And so Paul is saying, he's using that word, he's saying, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I'm branded with Jesus' name on me because I'm in his service. Now if you've, if you've read the Bible at all or you know Paul's story, 2 Corinthians enumerates some of the things that Paul suffered. Shipwrecked, beaten multiple times, uh, 39 lashes, um, he was stoned. He, he had not enough to eat. He got, you know, this all sorts of things. So he had scars on his body. And he's referring to them as the marks because he got those in his ministry following Jesus. He suffered for Jesus and he bared the marks of that suffering. See, in, in, in Western Christianity, we don't like to talk about the fact that suffering is just part of the deal. Christianity isn't meant to be a party from the moment you say yes to Jesus to the moment you dance into heaven. You know, it's not really a dance party. It is a hard life because the world is against you and Satan is against you, but God is for you and in him we have all that we need. But if you're looking for happiness nonstop, Christianity isn't going to give you that. But if you look for joy and peace, and love and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. You have it. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. And it will abound more and more and more. And joy is more than happiness. Mm -hmm. I can have joy while I'm miserable. Uh-huh. I can't be happy while I'm miserable. I will, I will trade happiness for joy any day of the week. Mm -hmm. And so... We need to accept the reality that we might have to suffer mm -hmm. for Jesus. Any true Christ follower, you're going to suffer at some point. Now, you might not be beaten to within an inch of your life. You might not be stoned. Luckily, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> you might not be shipwrecked or any of those things. And I don't bear the physical marks on my body from following Jesus. But I bear the marks in my soul from following Jesus. There's been hard stuff. Really hard, painful stuff. And if you could see my soul, you would see that I've been branded with the Lord Jesus. But I tell you the truth. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Not for anything. It's been hard. There's been multiple hard things. I just wouldn't trade them. Because I wouldn't love Jesus the way I do if I hadn't been through it. I wouldn't be the person I am today if I hadn't been through that. I wouldn't have grown the way I've grown if I hadn't been through it. And I've learned of all those other times that God has had me go through hard times. That now when our time comes along, I can actually already thank him for it and know that I'm grateful for this. Because I've been through that a couple of times and he's always been faithful. More than a couple, but you know. So, so that's what we get to learn. 
We get to say thank you for this because I know that what you're going to give me is so much greater than what it costs me. That doesn't mean you have to enjoy the pain. That's not what we're saying. But embrace the experience and know that God is in it for your good and His glory. And you are going to be grateful that you went through it. And I bet some of you sitting here can say, it was hell. <laughs> but I wouldn't trade it. Because I wouldn't be today who I am if Amen. I hadn't gone through that thing. Amen. And we have to remember that. And that's why we have to also stay in community. Because when we're in the middle of it, and it looks really dark and really painful, and we're just like, this isn't worth it. Because sometimes we feel that way. We need to cheer each other on. It'll be okay. Because God is in this with you. I've meant to write another book. There's many books in my head, kind of, but <laughs> not on paper. <laughs> uh, but one is, is memorial stones. Because in the book of Joshua, when they cross the Jordan, it's a different crossing, because God does different things, different ways. They, they cross the Dead Sea, was, uh, or Red Sea was in one way, and the Jordan was a different way. They had to step in and stand, and it would stand up. And then the priests, you know, one of each tribe had to pick up a stone and carry it out from the middle of the river and to the other side, and then they build an altar with those. And they call them memorial stones. And it was, if the families ever asked, what does this mean? That they would tell the story of God's faithfulness and how they crossed the river. And so I would encourage each one of us to, to embrace the concept of memorial stones. So when you are going through something hard or when you've gone through something hard, what symbolizes that? And what can you, you know, put on your mantle or next to your bed or somewhere, you know, in your kitchen or in your bathroom or whatever, that every time you see that, you're like, and God is faithful. He was there with me then, and he was there with me then, and he was there with me then. I have one of those in my office. It is a slate plaque about yay big. And I've told you a story before that. Um, before Harrison, we, uh, Fred and I had a match with a, a different birth mom, 16-year-old, who changed her mind two weeks prior to the baby's birth because she didn't like the names we chose. Which, you know, that's a 16-year-old behavior. And so um, I had a secret prayer pal, so this was around September, and God told her in September to buy this plaque for me. And she said, Lord, she'll already have her baby. And she could not get out of the pressure that God put on her to get that plaque for me. So my birthday's in November, and so I, I had been driving back to the office, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 was really just became more clear to me that day as I was as we were praying for a baby. And, you know, it's painful when you go through infertility. You know, then your child that you eventually get does things, and you're like, huh, I don't know how painful infertility actually was comparatively, but, you know, at the time it was really, really hard. And trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And God was putting on me, and lean not on your own understanding. And um, I can't get back to my office, and, and there's my gift, and I open it up. It was for my birthday. And it's a plaque, and it's painted yellow, and really nice. And it says, expect a miracle. And it was still six months before we matched uh, five and a half months before we matched with, you know, ultimately Harrison's birth mom. But that is a memorial stone to me. And it's hanging on my wall. It's always been a memorial. It was hanging out for Harrison's room for a long time um, once he arrived. But then through the next journey of challenge, when it looked like everything was going to go wrong, there was my plaque. God didn't say expect a curse. He said expect. And so memorial stones work. I'm telling you this because I want you to make it a practice to set these up in your own life to remember the promises of God. So when it gets dark and when it gets lonely and when it gets hard and when it gets painful, that you look at that memorial stone that God had you set up in that time that he got you from the one side to the other side through a very difficult, painful crossing. And you remember how faithful he was then and he's going to be faithful to you now. 
That is what I want you to remember. And that's ultimately what some of these marks are for Paul. They're certainly reminders of the pain he suffered, but also God's faithfulness, right? So then at the end of this chapter, the very last sentence says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. In all this, if you're not remembering anything else, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let it be so. And I just want to remind you as part of this story that a Christian or a Christian leader who has suffered for Christ has something to offer. Our unique community, as we're growing in Christ, we have something to offer because we've walked a path and we have something to say. When people say, you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know how hard life is. <laughs> we do, actually. I, I don't know, I haven't lived your life, but I know for me what was hard. And we all have something where we can come alongside another and say, I haven't, don't have the same experience, but I have the same God, and I've suffered too. So we bear in our souls the marks of the Lord Jesus. So, brothers and sisters, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.